Hello. I'd like to tell you a story. I'd like to tell you the story of a series of unfortunate effects. Our story begins within a realm not too different from the one you and I find ourselves in. It is a realm of programming, a realm of much wonder, but also turbulent history. Throughout time within this world, a number of kingdoms came to form, each with their own culture and their own language. The peoples of these kingdoms were very pragmatic folk, for they sought the creation, automation, and conception of some very odd things called programs. In time, some kingdoms found similarities between each other and gradually grew together. Others, however, simply came to be forgotten. Now, as with any story, there's not just good, but also evil. For within this world there dwelled a being that had much control over all kingdoms. It was a sly old creature, very devious, that many disliked, but much to everyone's dismay, he was universally necessary. Old tales simply named this creature Side Effect. Throughout the history of the realm, nobody had actually seen Side Effect's true form, for he ever changed his appearance. Nevertheless, even without a proper face, the people of the realm always knew when they conversed with him. Eventually, most kingdoms came to accept Side Effect, for he was a necessary evil. One region in particular, however, much disliked his influence and evolved its culture in such a way that it minimized his presence. In time, this led to the formation of a discipline, and this discipline came to rule its lands. The discipline stated, for every domain of programs built, identify whatever effects need to happen, separate them from the pure, and banish them towards the end of the program. This was, of course, the region of functional programming. Although all functional regions followed this discipline and shunned side effect as much as possible, the kingdom of Haskell, one of the oldest, disliked its existence rather exceptionally. They understood the pragmatism associated with him, but they felt that his influence was much too volatile. This was a feeling shared amongst the entire kingdom, until one day its ruler, decided to retaliate. The ruling program of the kingdom of Haskell started to exhume ancient scriptures about the land in desperate search of side effects origin and a way to combat him. Word of the programmer's keen interest in side effect reached him one day, and curious, he decided to investigate. He did not engage the programmer directly, for he knew his presence was unwelcome, so he decided to simply hide and observe. The programmer was still very much at researching his foe. He was partly frustrated, for there wasn't that much literature on side effect to go on. He eventually came to revisit the ancient scriptures of functional programming, for he thought there might be something of use inside of them. And right he was. The ancient scriptures also stated that within any program, any function is only allowed to be a mapping between two sets and should satisfy three rules, totality, determinism, and purity. The problem with effects was that they arbitrarily broke these rules. They either led to sets that were in total, led to different values of a set, or they didn't lead to values at all. Upon reading this, the programmer pondered and came up with an idea. What if one were to quantize all the outcomes of an effect, all the things that an effect could lead to, and define these as data in a data set. A function could then, instead of doing the effect, simply map to one of the elements of this set, effectively describing the act instead of actually doing it. For every type of effect, there would be a different set of outcomes, a different structure, if you will. Enchanted, the programmer started playing with this idea, but it wasn't before long until he encountered a problem. Many side effects returned data that were used in other side effects. His set-like representations could reference other data, but they did not allow access to it, for they were mere descriptions. So the programmer realized that these effects had to happen at some point in time, but he would have wanted them to happen at the end. So he thought of the following. What if he pretended to apply a transformation on the value of a set? 
If you were to do so, then the outcome of this action would be an effect embedded into the other one, a set within a set. These nested sets represented the idea of two effects happening in a row. But he might very much dislike this idea, for this nestedness could get arbitrarily deep. So he came up with a trick. If the transformation to be performed returned the same set, the same structure as the first, then the programmer theoretically had enough information to join these two structures together into a single one. He very much liked this idea, a bit constrained it was, but it truly allowed him to achieve that which he wanted to achieve. It managed to purify effects and make them manipulable. He called them monads. Glancing upon his creation, the programmer was filled with joy. He had finally the means to dispel side effect from his kingdom. From afar, side effect observed him carefully. He kept his distance, documenting and analyzing. He was by no means pleased with the result, but defeated he was not. For not soon, not long after, he discovered a flaw in the programmer's solution. Ever so grinning, he approached the programmer to retaliate. Congratulations, Mr. Programmer, he said. You've apparently defeated me. Surprised, the programmer looked upon his foe and thanked him naively with a compliment. I do thank you, he said. You have fought very well. This was all side effect required. He challenged the programmer by saying, but do tell me, Mr. Programmer, the curiosity is beyond belief. Programs are complicated things, aren't they? They don't just do one effect, but they do, they do rather many in various places and in various combinations. Tell me, how do your descriptions fare with these? How do your monads compose? Upon hearing this, the programmer was left baffled. He had not thought of composition. With side effects ever increasing grin, his joy disappeared as quickly as it came, for he knew he had not managed to defeat his foe. The programmer plummeted into deep thought. Concern but also humiliation plagued his mind. How come hadn't he thought about composition? Locked up in his study, he desperately sought for an answer. Meanwhile, side effect reveled in his success. He knew his reign over the kingdoms was left in challenge. But at the back of his mind, a thought came to form. Even without composition, Monad still threatened his hold on the realm. Considerably more concerning was also the fact that a number of other kingdoms started to hear about the programmer's monads and marveled at their power. Cautiously, side effect decided to return and continue observing the programmer's progress. Back in his study, the programmer was bent on solving the problem. He worked and worked relentlessly until, all of a sudden, he was reminded something about his initial research. In his initial experiments, he combined two effects by means of nesting one into the other. He quickly dismissed this idea for this nesting could get arbitrarily deep. But he realized that if he knew specifically, concretely, what the inner set, what the inner structure was, and that the outer set was a monad itself, he could exploit this information and tear the inner structure apart and bind the transformation to both sets simultaneously. In essence, he would then be able to combine two effects and transform them together. Much to his surprise, it was also possible to define a monad for this new composite structure, thus truly achieving manipulable composability. Cautiously, he checked and double-checked his findings. Even though confident in his results, he was aware of his foe's cunningness and wouldn't allow for the same humiliation a second time. But composability he did achieve, and monad transformers, he called them. The programmer pondered spreading his discovery. His care was not without reason for side effect, ever so vigilant, was following his every move. As time passed on and upon seeing the programmer spend less and less time in his study, side effect became suspicious. He knew something had happened and he desperately wanted to find out what, but trivial this was not, for he did not have access to the programmer's research anymore. As days passed, he also heard bits of conversation from people that lauded the programmer's cleverness and mastery. Fear crept up in his heart. Finally, he decided upon a new strategy. He decided he would traverse the entire realm and gather information by means of questioning its people. 
For months on end, he traveled in desperate search for answers, until finally one day, his journey proved fruitful. It was said that the composition promised by these Monad Transformers was rather closed and not open. One part of a program that did I.O. of Maybe and another one that did Future of List needed to do all of these effects at the same time for them to be composable. I.O. of Maybe a Future List or combination thereof. This meant that structure had to be added wherever structure wasn't really required. In addition, this unnecessary nesting led to terrible performance problems that was much too unoptimizable. This angered the kingdom's people, and they heavily debated dismissing the tool. Side effect, on the contrary, was very much pleased, for he now had the means to retaliate once more. And retaliate he did. He returned to the programmer's kingdom. Your malice is not welcome here, bellowed the programmer. That's no way to greet an old friend, responded Side Effects Lily. Much like the others, I am merely here to admire your greatness. Your admiration I do not require, responded the programmer. But yet I'm still here to offer it, said Side Effect. Too great of an invention, your monad transformers they are. You've truly achieved composability, haven't you? But at what cost, I ask? Side Effect proceeded to tell the programmer everything that he had heard about the people's complaints especially mentioning the skepticism. Once more, the programmer was left speechless. But this time, surprisingly, also slightly pleased. It took Side Effect quite a while to retaliate, much longer than it did him before. The programmer then realized that his creations, although broken, were truly challenging his foe. He accepted his defeat and applauded Side Effect for his cunning. Side Effect was beyond pleased. But what he did not know at that time was that his foe was now more motivated to defeat them than ever before. It wasn't long before the programmer came up with a new idea. Ever since, the, even before the last confrontation, he had spent increasing amounts of time studying the other functional kingdoms, for he was intrigued by the way they applied the functional discipline. Upon returning home, he pondered. The reason his kingdom departed from this culture was because even with this discipline, without proper vigilance, side effects could still pollute purity. He wondered if there were any way to explicitly enforce the functional discipline. He wondered if, instead of identifying effects, why not specify them? Gather them as the program progresses, but push forcibly the execution towards the end. Again, he was reminded of, about something of his initial research. Back then, defining all the outcomes of an effect as a common set of data allowed him to create descriptions of these effects and manipulate them. He wondered what would happen if someone did the same for all the individual effects of a program. Take all the effects a program was allowed to do and define them as data in a data set. This would suffice as a proper specification for all the effects a program was allowed to do. But this was rather incomplete. The program also wanted for these effects to be accumulated as the program progressed, and the execution pushed towards the end. How could this have been possible? He thought about this problem for a number of days, until one morning, whilst pouring himself a glass of water, he glanced upon its surface and saw his reflection. For a while, he stood there, thinking, but then it dawned on him. Much like his reflection pointed back to him, he could make effects accumulate by making every effect upon interpretation point back to the effect set itself. In essence, every effect would then, upon interpretation, produce the next one, and that one the next after that, and that one the next after that. He quickly started sketching an idea, and he thought that any program or computation can be defined in terms of the effect set that it was allowed to do, and the value that it would eventually return. Every effect from the set had to forcibly produce the next effect in the computation, so he defined the computational step that did exactly this. However, there was a simple problem. This step alone represented an infinite recurrence, which meant that the program would continuously produce effects without ever stopping. So in order to fix this problem, he defined an additional computational step that simply returned the program's result. 
Now, by using this structure, he was now able to accumulate as many effects from his defined set as he wanted. In addition, he could also extract them for later execution. Upon closer inspection, he noticed that this structure was not unlike the joining operation his monads did. But contrary to his monads, this structure was not bound to just one effect, to just one set of outcomes. It could be bound by any number. In essence, it wasn't constrained. No, no. It was free. For all those years that functional programming theoretically implied this discipline, the programmer finally managed to explicitly enforce it. And thus, free monads were born. Ever since his last victory, Side Effect was under the delusion that he had permanently defeated the programmer. So convinced he was that he started to ignore the programmer's existence altogether. In time, and without his vigil, word about the programmer's free monads started to spread throughout the land. One day, seemingly by accident, Side Effect found himself in the kingdom of Scala. He noticed a villager trying to build a program, and he was intrigued by its oddity. He stopped to observe. Much to his surprise, the villager defined every effect he wanted to do as data, and it was this data that he used in his program instead of doing the effect itself. He also noticed he used them in conjunction with something called free. Intrigued, side effect asked, and he received an answer that heavily angered him. He bellowed. The programmer had struck again. Realizing his delusion, he quickly started to interrogate the villager in order to find out all that he could about this oddity. But it didn't take him long until he realized something. As mischievous as side effect might have been, he was also uncommonly intelligent. And that which the programmer realized about free monads upon their creation, side effect realized as well. He noticed that free monads were sort of the essence of monads encoded. But he also noticed that the problems which plagued monads most probably plagued free monads as well. Ever so grinning, he returned to the programmer's kingdom with retaliation in mind. Thought of something new, have you? Asked Side Effect rhetorically. Come to annoy me again, have you? Responded the programmer equally rhetorically. Oh, no, 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 no. I merely came here to learn. Brilliant invention of yours, these three monads. They truly encode your functional programming, don't they? He asked. But tell me, programmer, much like the monads before them, how do your free monads compose? Needless to say, the programmer expected a challenge, but he expected side effect to complain about something else. His complaint was, however, about composition. Although frustrated, this gave the programmer an idea. Happily, he thanked side effect and applauded his genius. Upon hearing this, side effect was left baffled. With ever-increasing anger and feeling mocked and humiliated, he left the programmer study, returning to his initial vigil. The programmer actually never expected for free monads to have any improvement potential. In his mind, they were complete. But that which would later on prove the single most important improvement idea came from the very foe that free monads were created to combat. And the idea was simple. What if, instead of using one effect set for an entire program, why not define many smaller effect sets for each part of the program, and somehow later disjointly unify them together? By using a union of effect sets and the free monad structure to accumulate effects for each one of these sets, a program would be able to not just track its effects, but also track their evolution as the program progressed. This was, however, a sort of a hard problem, and the programmer thought about it for days on end. In his initial approach, he reached out for something that he had devised before. Unions of data were no novelty to him. He had once created a data structure called either that represented this idea of two values that could exist in a mutually exclusive fashion, one to the left and one to the right of the structure. In his mind, he could use this either to represent a union of sets. Within the free monad computation, he would use the left-hand side of this either to accumulate the effects of one set, and the right-hand side to accumulate the effects of the other. But this had several problems. The first was that his either data structure was not really suited for this type of union. 
because it initially was thought out for simple values. What the programmer needed were effect structures, higher kinds, or type constructors, as they were called. In addition, these effect sets, even though separate, still needed to conform to the same program result. So they needed to return the same type, eventually. The programmer proceeded to patch his initial structure to suit his needs. Now, the second problem was a bit more difficult. His encoding of the free monad didn't really allow him to use this union with it. Because of the way it was encoded, every effect in the free monad forcibly had to produce the next effect in the computation. So the programmer didn't have any chance to take individual effects and put them either to the left or to the right of the union. In order to do this, he needed to somehow split the effect itself from the computation that produced the next one. So he sought to fix his encoding of the free monad, and he thought of the following. He thought that any computation could be defined in terms of two things. The first was a computational step that halted its execution and returned its result. The next one was a different computational step that accumulated effects as the program progressed, but this thing was composed out of two. The first was the effect itself and its eventual result. And the second was a function that took the result of the effect and produced the next effect in the computation. Now, this still encoded his initial idea of a free monad, but its effects were less tightly bound to the structure. In essence, it was a somewhat freer monad. Much to his delight, he could use this freer monad structure in conjunction with this union to accumulate effects for two different effect sets. If he wanted to add one effect to one of these effect sets, he simply needed to either inject it to the left or to the right of the union as a new computational step of the free monad structure. If he wanted to interpret one of these, he simply needed to look in the structure for that branch of the union he wanted to interpret, interpret it in some way, and then remove it from the union altogether. Now, this removal from the union also indicated that the program effectively executed one of its effect sets. Upon closer inspection, he also realized that he could scale his union to any arbitrary number of effect sets. His current union had only two slots for two effect sets, but in theory, he could define one with three, and one with four, and one with five, and any number. But there was a problem. Every time one of the effect sets would get interpreted, the number of slots a union had had to be decreased by one, which meant that the programmer had to somehow prove that any union of four could be transformed into a union of three, any union of three into one of two, and so on and so forth, and any combination in between these. It was by all means possible, but the amount of transformations he had to define was immense. This angered him heavily. He was so close to a perfect solution, but yet his solution was incomplete. It lacked dynamism, and he knew side effect would complain about this lacking dynamic if he were to keep it. Ironically, he also knew what the source of the problem was. It was the union's arity, the amount of slots that it had, and how they got ca calculated. Much to his demise, he also knew how to solve the problem. Arity could be dynamically calculated by making or calculating it or inferring it at the type level based on whatever the program did. This displeased the programmer heavily. For years, he had tried to avoid the tools of the type level, for they were foul and complicated things and much departed from programming itself. But in his desperation, he felt he had no choice. That which he resorted to was not unknown to this world, but it was fairly complicated. RT could be generalized over by using something called heterogeneous lists. These were lists that could safely contain values of any arbitrary type and would allow the addition and removal of these values with equal arbitrariness. The list would then adapt its type description and its contents accordingly. But the programmer didn't read a list of mere values. He needed a list of kinds, of effect structures, of type constructors, one that would preserve the effect sets he added to them. So he sought out to build one. A difficult job this proved to be, for these lists were quite tricky to build. 
For example, if he wanted to add an element to the list, he needed to prove that this element could be a member of the list. For if the list already contained its type, it wouldn't need adapting it. Otherwise, it would. The same also went for removing values from a list. A difficult job this was, and hated it, he did. But in the end, he managed to create them. And open unions, he called them. Now, by using this open union, he was now able to add as many effect sets to this list as he wanted. And the list would automatically add them to their type and to their content. If he wanted to interpret one of these effect sets, he needed only to extract it from the list, interpret it in any way he wanted, and the list would automatically remove it from its type and from its contents. By using open unions in conjunction with his freer monad structure, the programmer finally managed to create a proper extensible effect system. And that's how he called them, extensible effects. Not long after he finished, side effect came barging in, neither slyness nor mischief in his eyes. You've come far enough, he said. Scared, are we? responded the programmer. You know, I do have to congratulate you. You finally managed to build something that will ultimately defeat me. But at what cost? You've meddled at the type level, Mr. Programmer. You've gone even beyond your own restrictions. I have broken you, haven't I? You know this realm cherishes speed and simplicity. You know they won't understand what you've built. Who will adopt your extensible effects now, he bellowed. The programmer simply looked at his disturbed foe. Ironic, isn't it, completed side effect? To have built that which would ultimately defeat me, but to know that nobody is ever going to use it. In complete silence, both foes simply stared at each other, exhausted. And so our story ends. It is true that the programmer truly built that which would have proven a formidable weapon against side effect. But it is also true that due to its complexity, this weapon was never meant to spread throughout the land. The fight between side effect and the programmer neither stopped nor continued. For in the end, they had both won and lost at the same time. Thank you. <laughs>